Hello, I'm Dr. Grant Cooper, the co-founder and the co-director of Princeton Spine and Joint Center. In this video, we're going to talk about frozen shoulder, also known as adhesive capsulitis. Now, a frozen shoulder is when you lose the range of motion in the shoulder joint. The range of motion loss usually starts with a little bit of a loss of external range of motion in the shoulder joint first, and the loss of range of motion can actually become quite severe to the point where there's almost no range of motion left in the shoulder at all. The cause of a frozen shoulder is thought to be inflammation in and around the strong connective tissue fibers that make up the capsule of the shoulder joint. Now, this inflammation then can lead to tightness, thickening, and overall lack of elasticity in the shoulder joint capsular fibers. The more inflammation that occurs, the more tightness and the more thickening that may result, and therefore, the greater the loss of range of motion in the shoulder. Let's review briefly the natural history of frozen shoulder if it's left untreated, and then we'll discuss how we can intervene in order to heal a frozen shoulder as quickly as possible. So first, the natural history if left completely untreated for a frozen shoulder is that a person will develop pain in the shoulder first, and the person then notices that certain shoulder movements exacerbate that pain. Sometimes the pain is worse at night, when you're sleeping on the side, um, the side of the painful shoulder, it may make sleeping difficult. Slowly over time, the shoulder becomes stiffer and stiffer. This is sometimes referred to as the freezing stage, and it can last up to about nine months, again, if it's not treated. After the freezing stage is what is sometimes referred to as the frozen stage, where the pain becomes less, and sometimes the pain will actually leave altogether, but the shoulder remains quite stiff and lacks mobility. This stage, again, if left untreated, can last for up to a year. And finally, after the frozen stage, for most people, even if they're not treated, there's often the thawing stage in which the shoulder gradually regains mobility. The, th the thawing stage can take as long as two years or longer for the shoulder to regain full mobility. The whole natural history of an untreated frozen shoulder generally takes about one to three years to go through all three stages. As sometimes, unfortunately, the symptoms never completely resolve. It may not surprise you to hear that the earlier that you can diagnose the problem and the earlier you can start treatment, the better the prognosis in all respects. So, what do we do about treating a frozen shoulder? Well, first of all, it's going to depend on what stage you're treating the shoulder in. If you're in the freezing stage where there's pain and a lack of range of motion, then the first step is going to generally be to remove the inflammation and the pain. There are several approaches that you can use to accomplish this. Depending on the degree of pain, physical therapy is a typical first step. Physical therapy will generally include several modalities depending on the amount of pain, inflammation, and the degree of lack of range of motion. Stretches, both passive and active, as well as some strengthening exercises will be used. The therapist may use ultrasound, electrical stimulation, and other passive modalities to help with the inflammation. If physical therapy is not making sufficient gains, and particularly if the pain is limiting the ability of the patient to participate with the therapy exercises, then sometimes a steroid injection can be helpful. But this is going to really depend on if there seems to be an underlying impingement syndrome or rotator cuff tendonitis, in which case an ultrasound-guided injection to this area can be very effective to reduce the underlying inflammation. If there's underlying osteoarthritis or possibly a labral tear in the lining of the shoulder joint, then an intraarticular shoulder steroid injection, again being performed under ultrasound guidance, or this can actually be also done under fluoroscopic or x-ray guidance, can be very effective. If a steroid injection is used, then of course it's important to use the steroid injection as a way to reduce the inflammation that will then enable the person to return to physical therapy in order to more fully participate with the therapeutic exercises. Some doctors will also block the suprascapular nerve that innervates the shoulder. The suprascapular nerve is a peripheral nerve that can be blocked under ultrasound guidance. It's not clear exactly how the suprascapular nerve block works as well as it does, but for example, a 2022 study in the Journal of Clinical Shoulder and Elbow found that a suprascapular nerve block along with physiotherapy worked better 
than an intraarticular shoulder injection along with physiotherapy, and better than physiotherapy alone in treating frozen shoulders. And whereas there are some relative downsides to intraarticular shoulder, uh, shoulder injections with steroids, blocking the nerve, blocking the suprascapular nerve, really doesn't have those downsides. Another treatment approach is to inject around the tendon or in the shoulder joint or around the suprascapular nerve for that matter using a liquid non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medication called Toradol. Now Toradol, it's also called Keterolac, is like a liquid Advil or a liquid Aleve. The advantage of using Toradol as opposed to steroid is that steroid has some potential downsides in the shoulder and around tendons that Toradol doesn't have. Two alternative forms of treatment include hydrodilation and manipulation under anesthesia. In hydrodilation, sterile water is injected into the shoulder joint in order to stretch the joint capsular fibers from the inside out. It's a nice idea, and some patients report at least temporary decreased pain and improved mobility. But at the same time, there was a 2023 meta-analysis in the British Medical Bulletin that found that hydrodilation's clinical utility remains unclear. There are potential drawbacks, complications. And in the end, the meta-analysis concluded, and I would agree, that further research is needed on this approach. Manipulation under anesthesia is exactly what it sounds like. The patient's put under anesthesia, and then a physician manipulates the shoulder joint while the patient is asleep. There are a plethora of potential complications from this, including humeral fractures, rotator cuff tears, brachial plexus traction injuries. A 2019 meta-analysis concluded that there's not much quality evidence for or against the use of manipulation under anesthesia when it comes to frozen shoulder. Now, given this, and given that manipulation under anesthesia does carry significant inherent risks, it remains a very controversial procedure when, you know, one that should be viewed skeptically and undertaken only with the greatest of caution. My own view is that I wouldn't recommend it, and in fact, I've never recommended manipulation under anesthesia uh, for a patient with frozen shoulder, or for anything for that matter. Surgery for frozen shoulder is very rare. One can perform an arthroscopic procedure in order to release the capsular fibers, but of course all surgery carries at least some risk, and this is often not necessary. Still, it's a possibility in rare and very difficult frozen shoulder cases. Generally speaking, the pain from frozen shoulder is usually successfully treated with some sort of combination between physical therapy and a steroid or toradol injection. The more difficult part and the more frustrating part to get better is the actual restoration of the range of motion. Sometimes when the pain is better, the range of motion is actually restored quickly, but at other times, the capsular fibers have become so thickened and tough that it's going to take time to break through those adhesions. And the cruel part about this is that in difficult cases of frozen shoulder, when the pain is gone but the stiffness persists, breaking through those tough adhesions can take time and can also temporarily increase the pain in and around the shoulder because you're breaking up those adhesions. And just inherent to restoring the range of motion in those cases is that those capsular fibers need to be stretched and that can be painful. Ideally, this can be done gradually and without pain, but sometimes the, the act of stretching them renews the pain. When this occurs, physical therapy can use their passive modalities like we touched on before, like TENS units, ultrasound, heat, etc. Also, a suprascapular nerve block can be helpful as an aid to take away the pain. And finally, regenerative medicine can sometimes be used to help with frozen shoulders. The most common approach with regenerative medicine would be to use platelet-rich plasma, or PRP. This is a procedure where the blood is taken from the, pa from the patient, and the platelet and the platelet-rich growth factors are spun down in a special centrifuge and then injected back into the shoulder with the idea that this is going to stimulate the shoulder to basically heal itself. The data for this is in its infancy, to be sure, but there are certainly anecdotal reports of it helping. In truth, if insurance covered PRP for frozen shoulder, I think it would be an enticing option to consider, but PRP can be very expensive. It usually ranges between $750 and $3,000 or more, depending on who's doing the PRP. Given that other more proven methods of treatment are available that are covered by insurance, I think for most people, it doesn't make a lot of sense, at least as a first-line treatment. Still, if there's a recalcitrant case of frozen shoulder, or if money is just not a factor, 
And PRP, as well as other regenerative techniques, is definitely something that could be considered as well. Thank you so much for watching. As always, if you have any questions or comments, or if you have any requests for future videos, please leave us a comment in the comment section. Uh, and please remember to press the like button on the video as it helps us with that insatiable YouTube algorithm. We really appreciate your support. If you haven't already subscribed to our channel, then please consider doing so now. Thank you very much again.